Uh, thanks everyone for coming out. Thank you, Alison, for putting this on. I see you guys have all decided to spend your Tuesday night with your accountant, which is fun. Um, I'll, um, I'm going to go through some stuff that Alison and I talked about earlier. And then uh, we've got some questions which you guys sent in, which is great. Thank you. And um, yeah, I'm going to go over the, the business startup and then some of the operations and processes you can put in place to get the business sort of functioning as it, as it grows. Um, to give you a background on me, I've done this for, been in the accounting industry in probably since 2003. So that's 17 years now. Well, that's a lot. Um, long enough to keep the power on. And then I've got, uh, on top of that, uh, I started this firm nine years ago. Three or four years ago now, we opened a franchise restaurant in Traugan as well. And then other business stuff, we've been doing some, some work with uh, non-for-profit beer sort of thing. So uh, it's just all different business models, but the same kind of rules apply. I can see a lot of you guys, some are existing, some are startup, which is awesome. So it's good to see even during COVID times, people are looking to grow their business. Um, I'll step through it. And then I've got some people in the waiting room. Alison, do you want me to admit them into the, yeah? I'm gonna hit admit. And then I'm just going to put this chat up on the side. So if questions pop up during the time, just put, put them in the chat and I will see them and then sort of grab them as I go through. Um, so for those, I can only see a couple of people, but I assume there's a mixture of startups and existing businesses here in the room. Yeah, beautiful. Two people I can see nodded, so that's good. <laughs> um, we'll go through that process and I'll... I was, I was in exactly the same boat that many years ago as well. So it's no different from me. So I'm only going to share my experiences and then you guys will have your, your own experiences as well. But um, <clears throat> one thing that I always learned uh, with the business when you're starting up, it'll sound very silly because you're all thinking about what can I do to start? What can I do to begin? But I would actually probably look at your end game for the business and go, what, what is the end of this? It's an old concept from, um, it's from Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is the book, if you want to look that up. But it's called Start With The End In Mind. And it's the idea is to go with me with the accounting firm. I was like, how many staff do I want? How big do I want to get? And how, um, well, how much revenue do I want to earn? Or what do I want to do? Because you will get to a certain point in your business cycle where it becomes about time and not about money. It's sort of going, all right, how many days a week do I want to work? I remember when I first started, it was like, I'm doing this to break time. I'm doing this to avoid nine to five, but I have to be very careful to not change nine to five to then becoming 6 a.m. till 10 at night sort of thing. So the first thing was to really sit down. It's, very, it's like writing your will in a way, but starting with the end in mind is to go, what, where are we at at the very end? And then once you've got that, you work backwards to figure out how to get there. So I was a big fan of like I said, avoiding nine to five and being able to operate within the times I wanted to and take the time off to spend that with my family. So um, after that, this is something I didn't do uh, in the very first instance, but I wish I had. So now I get to be hypocritical and offer it up as advice to people who, who are starting their businesses. But what I found is you should develop the ideal clients from the, from the get-go, find out about the people you do want to work with, if you're in the goods industry, that's a bit easier. Um, falling asleep at night, you can still sell your product online or, or what have you. If you're in the service industry, there's been a trend in the service industries. Hospitality is probably the best example of this in that uh, people started out as kind of a customer service thing. You were doing that little bit extra for your customer and so on. Eventually, with the power of Google review and Facebook, the customers soon gained control. It became customer demand. So my only advice if you're starting out is to, to find out exactly who you want to work with and, and make sure you continually strive for that. Um, that you can't sort of be all things to all people. So if you can find out exactly what you want to do and exactly the clients, at the start, there's that panic of like, well, I want to get as much income as possible. I'll, I'll do anything for everyone based on this business model. That's okay at the start but still have the idea of your ideal client because eventually as they grow and grow, you'll find yourself swamped dealing with people you might not want to deal with and not having time for the people you really enjoy dealing with. So step one was start with the end in mind and step two was develop the ideal clients. 
Um, for the new businesses, it's a bit harder. It's a bit philosophical. It's about thinking about who exactly you want to work with. But if I was to give you an example from, say, sports or any other, the, the people who are really good, think of any businesses, the people who are really, really good at what they do, they do one thing and they do it well. Do you know what I mean? They're, they're known for a particular product, not an absolute suite of products, you know. Um, or they give an example like uh, box, uh, Muhammad Ali is a boxer. He's a boxer. He's not a sportsman. He did boxing well and that was it sort of thing. I'm sure he was a good guy as well. But um, so I would just sort of go, I, I found that you have clients that you really enjoy working for and clients that you don't really like working for at all. <clears throat> and then everyone else is lost in between. It was easier for me, for the existing businesses in the room, you could sit down and look at your client base and, and go, who is taking up my time? Or your ideal client might be an inversion of everything you hate about that one client, which you're not going to name publicly. Do you know what I mean? So I've always been a big fan of not sitting there and going, oh, who would I love to work for? But sitting there and going, what, do I, what don't I like at the moment with certain, with certain clients and things? So I learned it on the back end, coming out saying, oh, I want to develop my ideal clients now, but I already have a bunch of clients that might not be suitable for me. Um, whereas if you can do that going in and continue to maintain it, if you're in the service industry, like I said, consumers have demand now, they've got your Facebook page, they've got your Google review. So maybe it's time for it to sit there and really think, who exactly do I want to deal with so that I can continue to get great results and and streamline that um, so that would be point two step one start with this end in mind to develop an ideal client base um, the third one kind of deals with cash flow at the start every business owner really wants to help which is great you find yourself doing a few things for people um, but the modern consumer even us online, we like to know what the cost is up front before we hit buy. It's, it's on the line, that's, that's developed from online. We can see, oh, this is $10, hit buy now, you're happy with the, with the price. Um, do that with your customers as well, be very clear, because you set the tone uh, at the very start. This is what I, this is what this costs, um, or this is what I cost per hour, depending on services or goods. Um, and you know they can pull the trigger on that the moment they hit purchase on whatever your product is or yes i want to engage the the service they've known from the outset sort of thing um so when you when you're setting that up make sure you you've got a strong policy on what you're going to charge and pricing that out my history with clients is a lot of people will forget about their own time they think oh i'm making a product i'm going to use some weird examples but we're making some candles, the candles cost this much. Well, so, so does your time. So don't forget about that. If you wanna benchmark yourself, I used to benchmark myself against Woolworths. That was my thing. I used to go, well, this takes three hours. And if I only charge X dollars for it, I might as well have gone and put baked beans on the shelf sort of thing. So there was a few times in my career which I nearly did, but I didn't, I stayed with tax. Um, so, Always value your time in the pricing of it. Tell your customers at the start what it is going to cost. Um, and then create a strong debtor policy. You want a document that says they get a follow-up uh, invoice seven days, 14 days might be a third one. By 21 days, I'm calling them. By 28 days, you know, it's another call. Debt collectors by 45 days or something like that. It sounds harsh especially at the start, because you're trying to do the right thing by a lot of people. But every dollar, if, you, if every one of you invoiced me now $1,000, please don't, um, I would turn around and if, if I don't pay that, you somehow spent all that money on materials, on time, which you could have been working at Woolworths and at various other places. Um, that's, you're, now, you're now holding the cash flow risk, if that makes sense. So... Goods are easier because you don't send it out until the invoice is paid. Services are a bit harder. So you've got to be straight up front and say, this is the cost at the start. It really just sets the tone for, um, for what it is. So once you've developed your, the, the, I guess the tone of the relationship, then also put in that debtor policy, write it down and stick to it because 
Nothing's more impressive than getting, for me personally, nothing's more impressive than getting that invoice bang on the seventh day. Or, you know, it seems like you're harassing, but it's, it's good business sort of thing. Um, so, start with the end in mind, develop the ideal clients, develop strong debtor management program, which we've just talked about. Does anyone have any questions on any of these three so far before I jump to, the, there's a chat on the right, but everyone's just happy to let me continue to ramble on. Oh, yeah. feel free to unmic as well, unmute yourself as well if you wanted to jump in. Yeah, if you awesome. like. So I recognise a few names actually. Um, so feel free to. Uh, so the last thing is, um, you've gone in, you've thought this is my end game. I've worked backwards. I'm going to tell all my clients um, what my my cash flow terms are because I know that at the start you get into that habit of going oh. I want to pay my materials bills up front or I want to pay whoever I owe up front just so I know where I stand. Then I'll know where I stand. That only works if everyone pays you up front as well. So it's really good to set that tone early on. Um, and then the last one, because you're figuring out your end game and you're scaling it back, this is, sounds probably a little bit costly, but there's just certain costs you're going to have to bear in business. Um, Try not to, when you're developing systems or processes or how you're going to do things, you've got to build it as if you were going to be at that level. There's no point sort of cutting a corner and going, well, this is, this is slightly cheaper than that. I'm all for cost leadership, you know, lowering your expenses. That's great. That's business. But, you know, buying a particular piece of software that's half price because it does one tenth of what the other one does, you know, you're only going to end up buying that software midstream you're going to be growing and then you're going to have to switch systems in the middle of your business when you have far less time and far less um what do you call it there's so many moving parts so when you've got your end game and you've figured out your ideal clients uh you, you've developed the tone that you want to set for them as you're building your little business think about your end game and go well i will purchase a particular piece of software or what have you that can scale up and up and up sort of thing. So in the accounting world, you've got your sort of top tier products, your zero QuickBooks online, MYOB, Reckon. I personally don't really touch the last two. We have a few clients on that. But on QBO, to be honest, zero's storm. QBO is good too, don't be wrong. Zero is currently beating them. It used to be around the other way. Um, those have tiered products so that you can step up. The ones that people jump in on like Wave uh, is one that's a really cheap one. Invoice to go. You end up building a database of 50 to 60 clients and then that software says, oh, well, we, we, we only allow you to do 50 invoices a month and now you've got to change the entire database into a new, new piece of software and learn it while you're flat out sort of thing. So I've been a big fan of <clears throat> finding out the end game and then going back to it and going, Everything I build has to go to the end game. So um, personal experiences for me, the last one, once you decide your system and who fits within your system, you can develop the process on how you do things. They pay X amount deposit. You have a certain process that you go through. The reason you don't want to be all things to all people is because each one will involve a different process and you'll become a, you know, a GP, so to speak. You're, you're kind of across everything. Uh, this is, if anyone's got any relatives that are doctors, I'm going to take this back right now. But you cross everything, but you're not very good at the one thing, if that makes sense. Um, so it's important to go, okay, be narrow with the concept. This is exactly what I do. This is exactly the people I go after, because I know that these people um, fit the process that I've developed. We have a lot of checklists and a lot of, I mean, look, accounting is exciting at the best of times. But uh, when we go down the, the checklist, it's kind of a little bit foolproof. And to do that, we had to narrow in on the softwares that we use. I said there was not a lot on my op, not a lot on Reckon. Not that I wouldn't love to work with them, but I, I would say to them, unless you're willing to change to some of the softwares that we use, I can't use my systems on it. Therefore, I can't do it as, as quick as I said I would sort of thing. And we've had clients that say, oh, well, I'd be happy to pay the difference. I said, well, it's probably not even really that. I just don't want to learn four different ways to do things. I just want to do the one, the one way. Um, so, so that probably is the kind of philosophical initial business, you know, um, figure out 
what time you want to work, how much income you need to generate within that time, um, and then develop the ideal clients you want to work with. It can be, if you're existing, it can be the clients you currently hate. It can be their evil twin, so that will therefore to be their clients you love. Or it can be just narrowing in on, as you're growing, finding the experiences you really loved. Clients that, we used to have a sort of a bit of a system that was, um, do they value and respect us or do they treat us like a transaction? So is it about the relationship? Um, from a tax point of view, uh, do they understand that their business and the tax system or are they, um, are they trying to break rules sort of thing? The third one is, um, well, obviously, do they pay their bills on time? That, that has to be one, unfortunately. Um, and then the fourth one is, do they have a growth mindset? Like, are they keen to grow their business and want to know how? Or are they sort of that narrow-minded approach of how much tax can I save, see you next year sort of thing? So we always talk to the ones that are like, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to work four days a week and I want to do this, this and this. It's like, okay, let's, what, how much work and what kind of work do we need to do to get you to do that sort of thing? So extrapolate the data, like look at the stuff and go, all right, if I do this much in sales for a week, how much would that be a year? You know, if you know you can only make five of whatever your product is a week, but you want to earn $200,000, the math might not add up. Do you know what I mean? Unless those five things are Mercedes. Um, other products though, you know, you have to sort of go, all right, it's taking me this many hours. I can therefore only generate this much a week and then times that by 52, you know. Always looking at the yearly data for me makes people go, gee, that's, that's actually cost me a lot more than I thought it would sort of thing. Or wow, I can actually, you know, if I keep doing, if I get to this many customers, that's when I know to say stop, no more sort of thing, because otherwise you'll find yourself, the first thing that happens when you take on too much work and so much varied work, you get so swamped, you'll do, the first thing you'll do is your admin on the weekends or late at night. And it's exciting to begin with, you're doing the hours that no one else is doing, it's in all the books, do you know what I mean? You're, you're an entrepreneur and then eventually you're, you have to say to yourself, I got into this to break the time rule. Now I'm just, now I'm just doing two, two people's worth of work in one, one day. Um, I'll switch over to some, oh, any other questions before I do that? No, everyone's still here, no one's left. So I must be saying something relatively interesting. Um, I'll switch over to structures and talk a bit about tax sort of thing. So good, everyone stayed on. The first thing is, um, there's a few different ones, sole trader, company, family trust, partnership. They all talk about the different, I'll touch on each quickly. Sole trader is the easiest and quickest to get going. Um, it's an AB, you go to the ABR website, abr.gov.au. It's free to get your ABN. Don't go to ABN, buy me an ABN.com or whatever you, they're just basically scamming you. Um, that has a low accounting fee because we only have to do a tax return, not not full financials if you don't want them. Um, and it's, you, you've had, you get an ABN within 20 minutes. That ABN's attached to your name. So mine would be Dylan Barron's, just the ABN. That's not a trading name. You would have to go to asic.gov.au to get your trading name. And that's the ones where you go on and call yourself, you know, um, Dylan's amazing accounting firm, which I, which I haven't bought. So you guys can buy that. Um, but if you had a name for yourself that you can, you can purchase that there and it gets attached to your ABN. So a lot of people say, oh, my business is called this. The first thing I would say is, have you registered that name? Because, you know, if not, someone else can pretty shortly. Um, you just want to sort of tie that up. The sole traders are okay, but you do have a lot of, just going to add this person here. Um, the sole traders are okay, but all income must end up in your name. So most people's, Start in the sole trader realm. There's um, Tanya there. Um, start in the sole trader realm. And then as they get bigger and bigger, they look for other structures. So I think if I circle back for a second, people would say, what's the perfect tax structure? There really isn't one. It's going to change over time. First is the sole trader, low accounting fees, simple tax return. I'm not registered for GST, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then the profits start going up and up. And then, or maybe you've purchased a house and you're thinking, oh, my business is a little bit risky. I don't really want anyone to try and, you know, attack me personally if I make a mistake. That's when we might shift it to a company. And then we go, look, your house is separate. That's a separate asset. We're going to protect it. The classic asset protection line from accountants. 
um, let's put it into a company. A company will pay its own tax, but the ATO are very aware of that. It's only 27.5%. So they're saying, look, you can put in a company, protect your home, but if you take any money out of that, it's, it's going to have to be a pay slip or something. We're going to put this in your name sort of thing. So you can't just put in a company and then take out all the funds um, and use them privately. So you might end up in a company, then you might meet your, your business partner soulmate, so to speak. You guys decide to start a partnership together or a different venture. Then if, either, if anyone here has family, you might go into a family trust. A family trust has all of its income, but it must distribute it to all the family members. So they're a really good vessel when you've got, say, 100, 200 grand profit and you know your son wants 20,000 and a daughter wants this and a brother wants that. So you can see like you start as a sole trader, end up in a company, start with a family trust, and then you might get sick of your entire family and then go back to a sole trader sort of thing. Um, all of that can happen. So there's no best tax structure. It's about thinking about the long run as well, sort of thing. Um, and then going, what, what eventually do I want to, to do? So um, I was saying for the guys that have just joined, it's almost hard, but you have to sort of think of the end game to, to decide where to start, if that makes sense. Um, so that structures in a nutshell. It's very general what I've given you. There's a lot of other stuff there that you need to consider, costs and things. But at least we went through sole trader, company, family trust and, and partnership. Partnership being two or more individuals. They get together, they decide to run one bank account, all the income and expenses are there, and then they just take 50% of the profit each or however many of you there are. Um, so we started with the, the end game. We've gone and sat on a park bench and thought long and hard about our ideal clients. Um, obviously not at the moment, don't sit on a park bench. We've developed a strong debtor management program so they know where we stand and who we want to chase. And then we've, every little system or procedure we put in place, we're allowing to build it, whether it's one customer or a hundred customers. We're going to follow the same procedure. It's very, um, the example I would use would be McDonald's. I don't know if you guys have heard of McDonald's, pretty big company. And, um, you know, they're very good at what they do because they're uniform in their systems. You can get a, you can get a burger from McDonald's in any country and it'll be basically built the same. To be fair, they have different menus, but any part of Australia and they're basically built the same. And that's that consistency of product sort of thing. So you want, it's very factory based, I suppose, but you want every customer to have the same experience, but, but the personalized experience as well. And that's where those, those systems and checklists, it's not that we don't trust ourselves to be able to pull it off. It's just when those checklists, they're not to make you an idiot and go, oh, tick, 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 tick. But it is a, a good point to go, oh, I didn't send that email, the follow-up email or the thank you email or, or any of that. Um, so now that you've got the ABN, because you went to the ABR website, not on Google and let them buy it, um, you would then head off to a bank. Um, we generally open two accounts. Um, <clears throat> one is the main trading account and the second as tax and GST, if you're registered. You only need to register for GST once your business sales are over $75,000. Certain other medical industries, it can change, but yeah, that's, that's the, um, generally the spot from the ATA. Um, once you're over that, you register for GST. I will say in the business world, we can, well, I say we, but there's a lot of businesses registered for GST, it's not just me, but we can spot on the invoice, oh, this person's not registered for GST. If you're planning on growing, you want to be taken seriously and you're dealing with big tender contracts or something like that, it's annoying, but the GST registration, you, you really do stand out. $1,000 plus GST is better than $1,000 sort of thing. So when you price yourself as well, never, if you can, try not to use too much of a round number. For anyone in business, when you see, you guys would see the bill. If you saw a bill from a, a, I don't know, a plumber or an electrician or whatever that says, 700 even you would think how how has he calculated that do you know what i mean so value your time and cost it out so that you can go three hours of my time i'm worth at least this an hour because that's what i would get if i went to Woolworths. so it's got to be more than that um and this is the materials to cost it therefore you know this this is what it costs to make sort of thing value your time and then that shouldn't I mean, if that turns out to be $700 even, fantastic. Well, that's good math, but try not to make that happen sort of thing. Um, 
So you go to the bank, you open up two bank accounts, one for GST and, and year end tax, the other for the trading account. And you basically get your, um, your two, you get your business card and your personal card. As far as what you can claim from that point on, you should really, this, the legislation says necessarily incurred in order to gain accessible income. That's the, the saying from the ATO. Um, what I sort of really mean is if you can say to yourself, I wouldn't have to do this if it wasn't for the business, then you probably should have gotten your, your business card out and paid for it with that. So you'll always have a bit of a fail safe at the end of the year with us, with the accountants, because we'll be able to say, oh, that massage because you were stressed about your business, that's not really allowable. Um, so we always can pull those out at the end. And <clears throat> if you find yourself using the wrong card by accident, transfer some money from your business account into your personal account and put the narration on it, you know, office works or, or reimburse stationary or whatever it might be. Um, the scope for a business is a lot broader than employees. So it's really about, you'll soon pick up the habit of going, hang on, I, I wouldn't have to have gone down and posted this and driven here. You know, to, I got up and filled up my car this morning because I had a bunch of deliveries to drop to clients. Um, wouldn't have to do that if it wasn't for the business. I'll get that card out. Then I paid my phone bill, which I'm on constantly because everyone messages me at 10 at night through my Facebook page. So um, then I uh, had to go post something to the post office or wouldn't have to do any of this if it wasn't for the business. And then if you bought lunch and went home, you could say, well, you would have probably bought lunch uh, anyway. You need food to live, not, not get paid sort of thing. So <clears throat> the reason I have a completely separate account is at the end of the year, you've kept all your receipts, you're kind of tracking how you're going. Um, but you can also see kind of at a snapshot where the business is at as well to be able to go, you know, oh, there's no money in here, business isn't going too well. Um, or you can sort of, yeah, so sort of track that along the way. Um, let's go to that. So structures, business accounts, year and a GST. Oh, the last thing I would say is kind of circling back to the philosophical stuff is make your admin time during the week. Don't, don't say I'll do all my bills on Sunday or I'll, I'll, I'll work nine to five during the week, getting all these products or services done. And then I'll just reconcile my accounting software on a Sunday. It's great in theory. It dies very quickly sort of thing. So if you're setting up habits that you're working on Sundays and Saturdays, or if you do, if you're working late at night, it's not been the exception. Um, you would sit around and go, "What? Why have I set that habit up?" You should allocate some time to work on your business. I know it's cliche, but uh, there's one particular morning I'll get a coffee and actually sit there and I'll look at you know how the staff are going and if they're okay, um, how the business has performed for the last week. It's in all those cliches, you know, uh, this isn't me personally because I haven't been to the gym recently, but all that, you know, you can't change what you can't measure kind of stuff. So looking at the financials on a pretty regular basis and going what went up and what went down and why were, why were my sales higher this month, not last month, or what did I do differently? Um, so, yeah, don't forget once you are up and running to allocate that time to look at the business. That's the fun thing to do is to have the coffee and go, how is this little thing grown from here to here? And as it's grown, what, what inefficiencies do I have? Like, am I just inefficiently busy? Am I just busy because I'm doing 10 different types of product when I know that, um, you know, these two sell the most, you know, as you start to sort of hard to tell, cause I don't know what everyone's business is doing, <laughs> but as you start to develop services and products, figure out the time of each one and cost it out. You know, that's, that's another thing from your McDonald's days is like, how much does this cost down to the cent time materials? Um, and then you could, you'll, you'll surprise yourself with your little menu of what you do to be able to go, hang on, why am I pushing, you know, this particular product I only make a certain amount of profit. This other one is, uh, is far more profit. You know, uh, is that something I need to be pushing more of or say, or, is it, am I, is there some other way I can save costs on the one I love doing and, or the one that is currently selling? Is there some way I can use the economies of scale and buy a, a bit more in um, materials or whatever it might be so that this becomes a much more streamlined experience? Um, 
And touch quickly on GST, 75,000 turnover, you can register for GST. The ATL will want you every three months to, to do a business activity statement or a BAS. Um, you're basically reporting your income and your expenses. When you're registered for GST, some of you now have two jobs. You have your business and you're a tax collector from the government, um, but no one really lists the second one on their resume. Um, so you're collecting all the GST for everyone. You might have done $11,000 in sales. Well, that $1,000 GST isn't yours. We need to hand that to the ATO. But you can turn around to them and say, well, I spent $6,600 uh, on accounting fees. Don't, but we do. Um, sure, what about the $600 I gave the accountant? That's where the ATO will line it up and say, okay, well, you, you collected $1,000, you've paid $600. Why don't you pay us $400, the difference? Do you know what I mean? That's how they do the BAS. Um, when it comes to year-end taxes, you have to earn over $18,000 to pay tax profit on your business. So if you earned $100,000 in sales and you add you know, $80,000 or $82,000 in expenses, you're gonna have a profit of $18,000. And, and that's what happens. The profit at the end is what you pay tax on. So some people get a bit conservative in saying, well, I'll put 10% you know, aside of every sale or something. You can. The ATO are the only people that will chase you on principle. They're just going to chase you anyway. That's their job. Um, so they're not going to see any of this, by the way. Are they, Alison? No. Good. Thank you. <laughs> um, so the ATO will chase you down for that. Um, beyond that point, it's about putting the right money aside. It's really hard to break that. As an employee, you get paid $1,000. They take $120 out. You're left with the $800 or so. dollars. That's your spending money. That's what we've always known. You switch to business, you get the thousand dollars, and then it's up to your discipline to put the money aside. A um, couple of strategies are to call the ATO and say, "What is my um, what's my bank account details for um, my income tax account?" I'll just be pay some money in every now and then. That's the people who have no willpower. They generally do that. I would suggest maybe putting on your home loan, depending on your structure, because you might as well save some interest on it before you have to hand it to the ATO. You might as well save some interest from the bank. Um, but each person's different. That's just a little bit of general advice. Um, but I'll also just track it throughout the year. So there's a few websites. I'm going to hand Alison some links at the end of this, which I think she's going to pass around to you guys. Um, a few websites you can track it and go, like I said, it's, it's Christmas morning. You've decided to check in on your business um, because that's how you treat yourself on Christmas. Um, then you've gone and looked at, oh, profits at about $30,000. Well, if I keep going the way I'm going, that's going to be $60,000 for the year. Maybe I better check what tax is on $60,000 and, you know, say that's $12,000. We might go, all right, by now I probably should have had $6,000 put aside. I'll just check my home loan account. Oh, great. I've got $7,000. I'm ahead for now. Do you know what I mean? So that's a very loose way of doing it. You can also treat all of your profit as if you were getting paid a wage. A lot of people do that. The ATO have pay as you go withholding tables. So if you're kicking off and you just want to know where you stand throughout the year so that you don't get blindsided by someone like me, um, you just want to say, okay, I, I earned a thousand dollars this, this week. Um, I also paid that Telstra bill. That's $80. I also paid some fuel. That's a hundred dollars. And then I paid some stationery. That's $20. Oh, now I'm down to actually $800 profit for the week. Maybe I should jump on the ATO website and see how much tax would a person who earned $800 have to take out, you know, and then I'll put that aside on my home loan. So it's just about being prepared and realising that not all of the, the money's effectively yours when you're earning ABN income. Um, that covers out most of the things. Probably pretty succinctly gone through this because it's my first time doing one of these. So I reckon... Yeah, start with the end in mind, develop the ideal clients, build strong debtors and expectations from the start uh, so that everyone knows. Don't be afraid when you're, when you're doing the ideal clients to really narrow in on your demographic. And then every system you build, because you know your end game, and it might be, might be here and you're here, or it might be just there and you're nearly there anyway, just develop the systems so that you can grow them to a point that you can go, all right, it doesn't matter if I do, you know, 100 invoices or 1,000 this is what it costs me a month sort of thing. It kind of accept those costs in a way. Um, you're then gonna look at your structures, sole trader, partnership, company, 
you know, cost is a thing at the start. So some people start sole trader, but you might have 10 properties in your name you want to, uh, you know, you want to protect. Um, and then, oh, that's beautiful. Um, yeah, cool. I'll jump to yours in a minute, Jess. Um, so you might um, pick sole trader start to keep costs low. Um, or afterwards you could, um, what do you call it? That questions just thrown me. Sorry. Can't do two things at once. <laughs> so yeah, you might want to put a certain amount of that, that profit aside. Um, but yeah, I better keep going. Sorry, Jess. If I've, uh, proof I can't do two things at once, Alison. Um, so yeah, develop that strong management program to develop, develop the scalable processes, develop the structure, Head to the bank, open separate bank accounts, get a separate card, keep it all in there. Some accounts, some clients of ours don't do that. We really strongly suggest you do that because I don't know, need to know that you're on Facebook saying you're on a diet, but secretly I saw you order KFC four times over the weekend. Do you know what I mean? These are things that we go, look, keep it all out of the business, keep your business on track and you'll lose scope. Tax deductibility, people talk about, oh, I want to save tax. I want to, you know, you'll get a lot of friends and family saying, you know, you can claim this now, you can claim that now, you can claim this. You can, yes, business has a broader scope, but you're not growing your business, you're just saving tax dollars. And that's where it's sort of like, it's such a one year attitude to be able to say, how much can I absolutely claim everything just so I don't pay tax? Like, that's great. Are you planning on growing this thing or are we just trying to get the electricity and gas claimed? Because that will work for so long, but you'll start to look at your profit and losses of your business and go, I don't, this doesn't even make sense to me because it's got your personal car, uh, some stuff there that really isn't for you. It's for the kids or something like that from office works. And you're like, well, what, you know, what is that? Um, but change, and I'll jump to Joanna's question in a minute. And then you allocate that time on your business. I'm going to switch to questions because it's quite evident that they throw me. <laughs> so, uh, Jessica, what percentage of all profit would you suggest to be put aside for GST and tax? I've heard a general rule of 30 to 35%. If good accounting software gives this answer away, so 90% of people jump on your zero QuickBooks online and they reconcile their bank and then they stop there and they go, isn't that great? It's good. You've got a green tick. You're done for the weekend. Head over to the report section because that's where it is. QBO has a GST section and zero has an activity statement section. You can actually check your GST at any point in time. Um, the rule of 30 to 35% comes from the fact that the first $18,000 you pay no tax, 18 to 37,000 you pay 19 cents, and then 37 to 90,000 you pay 34.5% tax. So what they've done there with the 30 to 35% has been like, well, most businesses are gonna have 50 to 60 grand profit, if you've put about 35% away, you're okay because the first 18 grand you've been putting too much away and then but you've lost, you haven't accounted for the 10% GST. So it's kind of like a rough, oh, this is where I stand. I'd probably jump on the accounting software. Once you've reconciled your bank, go to the reports because that's where the power is. That's where we're, we're there going, here are your sales for the last 12 months. Look at it go up and down like this. What, why is it always in July that it's down and you can go, oh, I go away in July. I go, all right, once again, none of these analogies apply right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, 30, 35% is an okay method if you want to sort of go, oh, that, that will do. But between the tax calculations websites that we'll give Alison for you guys and going into your relevant accounting softwares and checking on your GST reports, you could actually know down to the day sort of thing. I prefer that. Um, and then Joanna, Joanna, how are you? Are there any consequences for charging GST if you don't earn? No, there aren't. So in certain, in fact, in certain medical industries, they're exempt from certain GSTs. So um, you, can, you can still be registered for GST and claim all of your GST uh, on all your expenses and their income actually doesn't have GST on it. I don't know if there's any medical practitioners in here, but um, you can still register for GST below 75,000. You've just created that second lot of paperwork, that quarterly BAS for yourself. Um, sometimes at a business you'll, you'll register for GST anyway, you're opening a clothing store and um, you've decided to buy $40,000 worth of stock or a brand new car, or, or maybe you're buying a van for a particular service. 
you know, when you've got a $33,000 purchase up front to get the GST back straight away is good for cash flow sort of thing. So just know that the GST isn't yours. So that, that product that you used to sell for hundred dollars should now go up to $110. Otherwise you've just, you've just eaten into your own profit, so to speak. Does that make sense so far? Yep. Perfect. I'm going to sneak over to the questions that everyone's set up for me. And then I've got the chat window open. So, um, do you want me to just go down the list, Alison? I don't think not everyone's here at the moment, but, um, so, oh, how to market research if the business idea is viable. I've been a big fan of, if it's a brand new idea, like an entrepreneurial idea, you would have to go to actual market research and get a, a, a firm to do that. But for me personally, I've been a big fan of, um, what do you call it? Uh, you don't necessarily have to invent the wheel. You can always grab that wheel that works from somewhere else and bring it here. I'll use the Zambrero example. I actually used council data for this. So I went on to Latrobe City Council. There's, there's your free plug. Um, so for uh, all the economic profile data, it tells you what kind of people live in our area. We had a lot of construction, health and human services, um, and all, so which, you know, hospital, uh, power station, kind of gives it away. When we opened Zam, I was in the same boat. I thought, how can I get this thing to work in Traralgon? So we actually found one that was in Ballarat, like a similar idea and a similar concept. Well, it was a franchise, so it was the same idea. And we looked at their demographic profile on the council websites and said, okay, they've got the same kind of people. There's a university, there's a huge hospital, there's a, um, a lot of construction. Um, and they've got a population of about four times our population. So we called them up and said, how is it all going? Don't be afraid to do that, even if it's just email. I mean, you're obviously not going to call someone, if you're Taragon based, you're not going to call someone in, in Maui who has exactly the same idea as you. They might not help you, but someone over in Mornington or the like, I've been a big fan with our clients to say, give them a call because, you know, the real currency is in a free lunch or chocolates or whatever and saying, look, can we catch up? I'm doing something that you're doing, but I'm doing it that far away from you that it's not going to be, a, it's not going to be a, um, an issue. We're going up to tell you different things, but, you know, I've always been a big fan of seeking that expert advice. Go, what hurdles did you have to start with? And they might say, oh, all of these issues came up. So I had to do this, this, and this. So don't be afraid when you're doing the market research, find another council that has a similar profile to us or find the shop in that relevant council and then go, all right, this is a business in, <clears throat> don't think of another council name, but let's just say somewhere in Queensland. They sell this. Uh, Let's have a look at the council. Oh, they've got a similar mix of people that we have. Maybe that will work here. Do you know what I mean? So that's how we did it with, with Sam. Um, if I go to the next question, let me know. Um, <clears throat> what's the first thing you do if you want to start your own business? Start with the end in mind. It would be my key. If you know the end, it all becomes really visible. It's it's a bit of a soul searcher thing I know, and it sounds very philosophical, but you have to go, what is the dream here? And really narrow that in and go, I want to work. They say like when you're developing goals, the longer the sentence, the more chance you'll achieve it. So if you say, oh, I want to, I want to earn a, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or something. You say, okay, that's fine. But if you can say, I want to earn a hundred thousand dollars by working four hours a week. And I only want to work with clients that do this, this, and this, all of a sudden you're starting to get very real, sort of coming to part through the, through the mist. So narrow in on the end game and then go, what, what would I need in place to do the end game and then scale it back to, you, to your, start, your starting game. Um, what's your best advice for determining how you should fund your business? Uh, probably a cash flow forecast. So we do these ones and you guys can do it at home too. It's not too hard to go, all right, if this is my sales, and these are my materials, how much would it cost to, uh, how many of these would I have to sell to make X dollars? They cost $20 to make, I sell them for 100, I make $80 profit, and I wanna make uh, you know, $800 a week. Therefore, I have to sell a 10 a week. That's, that's really it. Um, and sort of extrapolate that out for the year. And I know it's a bit of like Excel work, but it's nice to think in years and go, um, you know, for some of our bigger clients, a phone call to a supplier and sharpening the price by, you know, 10% can be an extra $60,000 in their pocket for like one phone call sort of thing. So, um, 
always always track that. Um, as far as figuring out how to fund it from that point of view, kind of depends on the assets you're buying, sort of thing. Once you once you, if it's a big asset outlay like a, a vehicle or the like, I wouldn't say rush out and get finance, but sometimes the cash flow isn't there. So if you need that in order to get your business up and running, just whenever there's an obligation, a cash flow obligation, or oh, now I have to make this this repayment on this car every fortnight, just realize you should always go back to how much do I have to sell in order to cover that at least. Don't end up in a position where you're just creating a lot of income for banks sort of thing. Um, don't, don't put everything on finance because, and then rely on the sales to get through. Uh, what are some ways to find mentors for starting up a business? Uh, well, there's these. Um, there's also, the, every little business, every little town should have a BNI group. I'm not part of that BNI group, I must admit. They allow one per, per um, what's the word, industry. And so I didn't make the cut for that one. They already had an accountant, but that's okay. Um, so looking for the mentors, pick people within your own industry. The whole world wants to help each other in some way. Like your own, look, thinking of your own business, they're all your, sort of your own little children in a way and you're watching them grow how proud would it be if someone asked you, how did you do it? Where did it all start? You get a lot of customers and clients already do that. You know, how, what, what can you do? Imagine going to another business owner and saying, Hey, I was where you were three years ago. What did you do? You, they're going to love telling you about that sort of thing. So like I said, you're not going to pick a competitor who lives next door. You're going to pick someone, you know, we don't have to invent the wheel. We can benchmark it. We can find somewhere in Melbourne that does, you know, a lot of really cool stuff that we would love to do. So you call them and say, once again, not right now, but you would catch up with them. And, um, and then, yeah, I realize after six weeks of COVID, this, this uh, recording probably won't make sense, but right now we're in lockdown. So um, I'll put that on the recording. Let's go down the other one. How to set up a business plan. Do you know what the best part for this is? Latrobe Valley Authority offer grants to set up business plans. Um, I'm not sure if they still do now, but I would contact them. You take that business plan, uh, they usually offer a grant for that. You head to business.gov.au. There's business plan templates on there. They're very, very involved. So it's sort of, um, you'll find yourself logging in. It's like, so who's your marketing director and who's your chief of operations and, you know, who's your international ambassador? And you'll find that you're every one of those sort of thing as you fill it out. Um, but yeah, if you are looking at setting up um, a business plan, Offer the, get the grant from the LVA if you can, or any other grants, the small business grants that are getting up and try and use it in the local area. Speak to business advisors. I'm not gonna plug myself, but speak to business advisors in the area and accountants and go, got this grant. Um, maybe don't mention the price of the grant. Ask them to quote the grant because that way their fees don't happen to match your grant. Um, so set them up and say, you know, going for this grant, can I get a quote? Um, and then yeah, work with it work with an advisor sort of thing as closely as you can we've got some clients that are pretty self-sufficient and they love working their own but i must admit we we don't mind catching up because that's where we we get to sit there and go talk about the business and go i always have some clients that go look we only see each other once a year we really need to and that might be because they do their own bass or or they only want to catch up once a year that's fine but that's kind of what we're here for to be able to go if you come in and say, oh, I've, I've done all my accounting, I just have no idea what these reports even tell. That's what I love doing. So you go, look at this, this, this is what this says sort of thing. I've never seen a successful business where the owner says, oh, I, have, I have no idea how to look at financial reports. I've got an accountant that does that. Not, that's not a Richard Branson kind of thing to do sort of thing, even though he was illiterate for a long time. Um, so I'm just going to jump over to this other chat. No one said anything to me. Good. Uh, you're welcome to though. So date set everything in place. <laughs> Beautiful. So date set everything in place. Um, just want to know how to get momentum for the launch. It's going to be specific to the to your business, um, but I'll do my best to be broad. Social media is huge. Looking at when you find, when you narrow in on the demographic of who is going to be your customer or who you want to be your customer. You've got to sort of say, what would they do? Are they online? Are they newspaper? What mediums do they use to, there's no point trying to advertise to the elderly on TikTok. Do you know what I mean? They're not going to get it. Um, and to be honest, I'm mid thirties and I don't get it. Um, so 
you've been able to go, all right, how would I connect with them and keep the, get the word out? Um, branding is huge as well. Never underestimate the power of, uh, of good photography. I know it's a pain. They're kind of necessary evils and you think well, I'm just sort of yelling to an empty room, but you are developing a name subconsciously, I think in people's minds. Um, competitions are a weird one as well. It, it really would come down to the, I know I'll use the example, Zambrero for example. I think we put a, a competition up for a, a free $50 voucher and it meant, you know, it meant, um, not a lot to people. They they tagged a friend or whatever, but it was just seemed to be the one free burrito for your friend that just just went crazy. And there's there's we couldn't figure out a lot of logic behind that. Um, other than it was something we said tag two friends, one you would share it with and one you wouldn't, and let them decide. And that just went. So always for every marketing that you do, there has to be a call to action. They call it. So where I'm not a marketing expert, by the way. I'm sure there's another workshop that has or will be done but um there's always been a call to action like if you like this do this uh rather than just you know here here we are sort of thing so try to engage in them that way um let me keep going down this list here there's actually not a lot of other questions so i'll probably just throw it open to the chat or the room um anyone <laughs> Anyone in particular want to know anything about it? Have I gone off on a tangent? Does anyone want to know? Uh, want me to realize, I don't know, go over any old ground? Or that's sort of really it. It's just develop your strategies early on. Um, should you get a lawyer to help draft up contracts and policies for employees? Uh, is that one there, Joanna? Uh, I'm assuming she's yeah, yeah. Do you know what the best part about using advisors are? Is uh, especially in the like of, of legal um, advisors, you've you've removed the risk from yourself as a business owner. Um, it's kind of now covered under their insurance. They drafted up the contract, not you. Therefore, they'll know not to put in the clause that says that you can call them any time after midnight, sort of thing. They'll be able to go. You can say, well, I got this drafted up by a legal practitioner. They're not cheap, but um, they do a lot of good work. Yeah, got you. More clients use other companies. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Uh, me personally, if you've got the funds to do it, I would use legal advice because like I said, they're bound by it and it's under their, their uh, what do you call it? Professional indemnity insurance. Once they draft it up, it can get pretty expensive once it gets going. I know in certain industries where they might go, well, that particular person is seeing maybe one of your clients. Um, oh, good. So that's good to know. So, Joanna, I would suggest, I guess so that's that's a nice referral there from Jess to you, Joanna. Um, yeah, I would stick to it. When you start a business, you want to stand yourself with a, a business professional and a legal professional. Finally, uh, is an insurance uh, professional as well. I know insurance is betting on something going bad, but in the world we live in where even today, once again, I said Alison earlier, but disclaimer, this is general advice only. You should seek your own personalized advice before taking action. You can see how many times I've said that sentence. Um, it's important to go legal professional for the legal work, uh, business advisor accountant for all of the ATO compliance work, and to have someone to chat to and talk about growth and you know what other clients they have in that industry. Uh, and then insurance to make sure that I haven't left any doors open on myself. So that's where the structures come into play. We might have a client that is a photographer and it's like, well, how am I, you know, that's going to be a little bit less risky than a client who's just become an electrician sort of thing. You know, which, which one are, are you going to have more risk associated with? But that same photographer could have bought a new house and is really worried about it. Well, then we talk about asset protection. So it'll grow over time, but always remember there's an end game. So, we like to think we'll be in business forever, but at the end you have to think, well, I can do this forever in a day, but what would happen if I did want to, to sell the business or what is the final game? Um, yeah. So if you decide to become a company or a family trust, do you suggest paying yourself? You will. Yeah, definitely. Um, with a company and a family trust, the ATO are very conscious that the company tax rate is 27 and a half, but you will, um, if you take any money out, they're going to say, 
Yeah, fantastic. They're going to say, um, you've taken some money out, so how much tax? I'll give you a really extreme example, but you would have to live like you're, you're um, in one of those uh, documentaries. But if you only took $18,000 out and tried to live off that for the entire year, um, the company would be able to claim that as a tax deduction. It would save 27.5% on roughly 18000 and you would pay no tax in your own name. So a company is a good way to protect assets, keep the business separate, it means that if I have an issue with one of your products and I try to, to sue for whatever reason, and you know, they're out there, um, there's people hoping for that. Um, then we can say, all right, they're all assets of the company, my house, my car. So and any wages I took out, they're all protected by me sort of thing. So once again, general advice. Um, so yeah, I would, I would definitely pay yourself a wage and you should stick to a systematic wage. Payroll has become very important over the last couple of years. If you go to company structure or you guys are in trusts or whatever, the ATO are doing single touch payroll. You would notice none of you got pay as you go summaries this year, or if you did, that was nice of them. But basically the ATO know what we earn every week anyway, sort of thing. So it's very big brother. Um, to When you're going to take your wage out, to go into your payroll every, every week, do a pay run, oh, how much money did I take out throughout the week? You know, that's one of the benefit of being a sole trader. You can sort of take it all out. But to go back and go, I took $200 on Friday, $500 on, you know, I would just pick every Tuesday I get paid $800 and that's it. Do you know what I mean? Until it kind of gives you the discipline back a little bit as well, which is great. Um, any other questions for me while we're going? It's sort of, I like this little chat thing on the side. It's nice. Um, but I think that's sort of really it. What do you think, Alison? Have I covered off on anything that um, should have done anything? Yeah. No, I think I think you've covered everything that we've spoken about previously. Um, did just before <laughs> I wrap it up, did anyone want to unmute themselves and ask any questions of Dylan? Not very often you get <laughs> the chance to have some free accounts. Yeah, it's basically so, yeah. So I'm for the for the next, you know. However, I'm happy to stick around if anyone wants to talk. But yeah, basically um. What do you call it? Yeah, it's basically free accounting advice, really, for the moment, sort of thing. So, um, but yeah, I think that'll give it a good start. There, yeah. Some of this, in hand on heart, some of this was the stuff I learned the hard way. You know, developing the ideal clients was something I wish I did ages ago. Um, you know, to be able to go, um, yeah, I wish I'd done that earlier. So now, now sometimes you have to deal with who who can't I service anymore or what have you and develop those procedures so yeah there's not saying that I'm somehow you know impervious to mistakes I can still make mistakes but this is what's developed it to to go from tower to Zam to little Gipsam brewing all the same procedures and systems are in there um, that wasn't a shameful plug by the way um, but all those systems are in there and it's just breaking it down and going, what's the end game? What's the, what's the checklist to get to that end game? And does my end game account for time? Does my pricing account for time? Am I getting anything back? Um, if it's every Friday you want off or if it's, or you want to work seven days a week or just when kids are at school or something, I don't know, you can make it work. Technology changed the game. We're, we're on 24 seven now sort of thing. So pick your on time, pick your off time. And, and make sure you, you stick to it. Don't let anyone grab that and pull it away from you. So, yeah. All good. Fantastic. Thank well, you. I will wrap it up then if no one else has any questions. But thanks, Dylan. It was really informative. And obviously, you coming not just from an accountant perspective, but also a business owner, um, just made it really relatable. And I hope that everyone found it beneficial. Um, if there are any questions at all, please just send me an email and I'll forward those on yeah. to Dylan. Um, I'll also be um, sending out the links that he mentioned earlier in the coming days once this webinar is put onto our website as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is a series. So we are doing another webinar in two weeks time. And the topic of that one is how to apply for grants. Um, which is in reference to our small business grants program, which is currently running. And if you'd like any further information on that, please look at the Trove City Council website. Um, but otherwise, thank you all for joining us this evening and um, I hope you have a lovely night. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.